Good evening, I'm Ian Hanamansi. Fighting back the rising tide of COVID-19. Surging numbers in Quebec and Ontario and the new efforts to get them under control. We absolutely think the actions last night in light of the concern with COVID-19 are abhorrent. Reaction to the death of a former prime minister. Brian Mulroney weighs in on John Turner's contribution to this country and their famous political rivalry. With one signature of a pen, you've reversed that, thrown us into the north-south influence of the United States. Europe's biggest bank is found handling billions in suspicious money, and thousands of those transactions involve Canadian institutions. Canada is such an easy mark to hide dirty money. This is The National. As summer gives way to fall, Canada struggles with a COVID-19 infection rate not seen since May, prompting fears of a second wave. Canada saw close to 900 new cases today, and we won't know B.C. and Alberta's numbers until tomorrow. Among the confirmed cases, two minors in Nunavut, believed to have been infected outside the territory. That is a small number, but it has big significance, as every part of Canada has now been directly touched by COVID-19. There is no mistaking the trend across Canada these past several weeks. And figures from Canada's two most affected provinces tell the same tale. For months, Quebec was Canada's COVID-19 epicenter, and there are signs it may reclaim that title. With 462 new cases today, that's prompted Quebec to increase its COVID alert to its second highest level. Simon Nakaneshny has that tonight. Canada's second largest city shut down. Businesses closed, schools too. This is what Montreal looked like this spring. Now with cases climbing again, the province is retightening the rules. I don't want to ha be in a bad situation in Christmas time because we haven't done what we're supposed to do. When Quebec unveiled its new color alert system, most of the province was at green, the lowest level of danger. Now less than two weeks later, as daily new cases climb, that map has changed color to yellow and for the first time, orange, including parts of Quebec City and Montreal. Nobody wants to have to go through another major shutdown again. It becomes a question of, are we prepared to give up certain things that we enjoy now in order to prevent that from happening? So far, those things haven't been restricted, but they have been scaled back. The number of people allowed at private gatherings indoors is down from 10 to 6. Attendance at public places where alcohol is served, like weddings and picnics, is capped at 25, down from 250. And travel between regions is not recommended. Restaurants and bars will have to stop serving alcohol at 11 o'clock instead of midnight, with a maximum of six clients per table. We're happy we're still open. Uh, like I said, it's, it's, it's tough news. It's tough news in general for all the population. I wish the people were just taking this more seriously and we don't have to go to red because who, who knows what it is. The government says the situation is not out of control and if citizens make an effort, measures could be relaxed again. But if they don't, these restrictions could get a lot worse. Simon Akineshny, CBC News, Montreal. And Ontario is not far behind Quebec in its escalating number of cases, reporting more than 400 yesterday for the first time in three months. Today was down, but not by much. And as far as Morali tells us, officials have no patience for rule breakers. This was Saturday night at a cinema parking lot in Hamilton. Hundreds of cars showed up for what police called a mega meet. Uh, just trying to see some nice cars. There were so many people. Officers from three different police services had to be called in. This on the same day the province announced new limits on gatherings. We absolutely think the actions last night in light of the concern with COVID-19 are abhorrent. The participants should be ashamed of themselves. It's not the only place where people were breaking the rules. The mayor of Mississauga tweeted Saturday, bylaw officers there have been busy, handing out tickets at house parties and wedding receptions. We can't have these wild parties right now. It's just way, way too risky. The province's new rules only allow 10 people to gather indoors and 25 outdoors. It believes the rise in new infections stems from large private gatherings. I think we have to be very careful here in terms of what the messaging needs to be. You know, private social gatherings is anything like watching the game together or, you know, two families having a sleepover together. It's not just people partying. 
The new limits don't apply to bars or restaurants or to schools, but there are new cases confirmed there. This Catholic school in Ottawa is now closed for two weeks after two students and two teachers tested positive. It's the first elementary school in Ontario to officially close. I've been here for about two hours now. The surge in new cases has been met with long lineups at testing centres. The province also announced this weekend it's adding more centres. Like this converted parking lot at the Canadian Tire Centre, home to the Ottawa Senators. More than two-thirds of today's new cases are people under the age of 40, like many who came to this mega-meet. With that, it seems, the province needs to do more to drive its message home. Farah Morali, CBC News, Toronto. And British authorities also deeply concerned about the possibility of a second wave overwhelming their country. The nation faces a, a tipping point, and we have a choice. That choice, follow the rules or face more restrictions, including a possible second lockdown. This weekend, Britain introduced fines of almost $13,000 for failing to self-isolate when required. The country reported almost 4,000 new cases today. All throughout this weekend, Canadians have been remembering former Prime Minister John Turner. As a dashing young politician, he was sometimes called Canada's Kennedy. Turner was Justice Minister in Pierre Trudeau's cabinet when homosexuality was decriminalized and during the October crisis when civil liberties were suspended. As finance minister, he weathered the 1970s oil crisis. A career in public life that peaked when he became prime minister, a job he held briefly and tried twice to get back. Stephanie Mercier looks back at his life and career. Well, here's John Turner uh, into the UBC Sports Hall of Fame. Before he ran for Prime Minister, John Turner was running for UBC. The noted politician was first a track star of Olympic caliber. Sprinter Douglas Clement met him at the 1952 Olympics in Helsinki. I have no doubts that he would have actually made the team because he was that good an athlete. But life would lead John Turner to a different type of podium. Born in England, he came to Canada as a boy and began practicing law in Montreal in the 1950s. These photos of him dancing with Princess Margaret made international headlines. In 1962, he won a Montreal seat for the Liberals and was seen as a rising star. But after a rivalry with Pierre Trudeau, he shocked the party. I hereby resign my seat in the House of Commons, effective immediately. Turner made a comeback in 1984, winning the Liberal leadership and becoming Prime Minister, a post he held for just two and a half months. His party took a beating in a snap election. He held on as opposition leader and famously battled Brian Mulroney over free trade. Wrong Once again. a country opens itself up to a subsidy war with the United Wrong States again. in terms of definition, then the political ability you. of this country to sustain the influence of the United States. Turner retired from politics in 1993, but friends say he stayed very engaged. He did the country a great service in showing that ideas count, conversation counts, but also good, tough political competition. And I think as a result, we're a much better country for that. On a personal level, he's being remembered for his loyalty. But I remember John as a, a very kind and, and dear friend, uh, someone who was just incredibly loyal. Uh, and uh, to this day, uh, uh, he would make a phone call uh, on my birthday. John Turner was 91 years old. Stephanie Mercier, CBC News, Vancouver. Back in 2011, Turner was asked how he would describe his own political legacy, and, and here's what he told Peter Mansbridge. Any legacy, I hope, would be a legacy of example. Committed to public life and public service. Love thy neighbor as thyself. And that means in a free society, in a free country, contributing to electoral politics as well as bureaucratic politics. But Parliament is supreme. Let's go back to Magna Carta. Democracy, Peter, does not happen by accident. Some of the same themes we've been hearing about Turner tonight, who he was as a politician and a person. Peter, of course, spent decades covering Turner's career, and it's really nice having you on the national tonight. Uh, you know, as we hear John Turner say the things he said to you in the interview, they, you know, you don't often hear politicians maybe these days using those kinds of terms, but that very much is who John Turner was. 
very much what he was and who he was. He talked, he always talked about democracy in the sense that it doesn't happen by accident. He tried to instill in others, and especially young people, that if you believe in democracy and you want democracy to survive, you've got to participate in public service. Uh, th and this is something that he'd obviously shown throughout his life. He grew up with a life of privilege. I mean, he went to private schools. He was uh, a Rhodes Scholar. He went to Oxford. He was a great athlete. I think there was a time in which he even held the record for the Canadian record for the 100-yard dash. Uh, but he decided he wanted to go into politics. He decided he wanted one day become prime minister. And he became prime minister, the 17th prime minister of Canada. Now, it was short-lived, and it wasn't a good particular time in his life. He didn't handle the situation well. He'd been out of public life for about 10 years, and a lot of change in politics between the mid-'70s and the mid-'80s, and it passed him by. And when he came back, he got trapped in a number of areas uh, that he just didn't handle well. And so when given the chance, when earned the prime ministership, he lost it almost immediately. I think for a lot of people this weekend, that's all they see about him as they read the one paragraph description. But tell us a little bit more about his public service. Well, and it would be a shame if, if, if we looked at John Turner and only saw those two and a half months, I think it was. Uh, he had been a, a, a cabinet minister early in the 1960s. Lester Pearson appointed him into the cabinet in 1963, I think. And he, uh, by 1970, he was the minister of justice through the October crisis. He was the minister of finance after that through a difficult period with the economy because of oil prices uh, and, uh, and some early deficits that uh, he had to try and manage. He left on a matter of principle, which was all part of public service too. He had campaigned in 1974 against wage and price controls. In 1975, uh, his prime minister, Pierre Trudeau, instituted wage and price controls. And while he didn't make a big public scene about it, it was clear that that was part of the reason he got out of public life in the mid-70s. It's a nice reminder that for some politicians, maybe many politicians, public service is very much a motivation. Peter, thank you very much. Thanks, Ian. Good to talk to you. And we'll hear more about John Turner from someone who knew him very well. My conversation with former Prime Minister Brian Mulroney is coming up in about 30 minutes. While an apparent attempt on the U.S. president's life has been thwarted, a piece of mail addressed to him containing an infamous deadly toxin. Investigators believe the letters came from Canada. And as Ellen Morrow tells us, CBC has confirmed there's a suspect in custody. Tonight, there are reports a woman was detained trying to cross from Canada into the U.S. carrying a gun. The suspect who allegedly mailed this envelope addressed to the U.S. president. Posted with a Canadian stamp marked H4T, suggesting it went through a Montreal area sorting facility. Inside, ricin, a deadly poison with no known antidote, targeting Donald Trump from north of the border. The way that the letter was addressed, which was to the president of the United States, it leaves very little room for um, supposition about motive other than it being sort of politically motivated. Authorities have not confirmed the motive. Ricin was also reportedly sent to two law enforcement facilities in Texas, but the FBI said there's no known threat to public safety. The envelope was reportedly intercepted at the last processing facility before it would have been delivered to the White House mailroom. The investigation into who sent it is being led by the FBI's Joint Terrorism Task Force with the help of the RCMP. It's not the first time a president has been targeted with ricin. Envelopes with the deadly poison were addressed to Barack Obama in 2013. And in 2018, packages containing ricin were sent to the then defense secretary and the FBI director. The substance is infamous, used to assassinate Bulgarian dissident Georgi Markov in London in the 70s. Markov was stabbed with the tip of an umbrella injected with a pellet laced with ricin, dubbed the umbrella murder. The suspect in this case is now expected to face federal charges in the U.S. after targeting one of the most powerful men in the world. Ellen Morrow, CBC News, Washington. Ruth Bader Ginsburg showed how U.S. Supreme Court justices can influence the direction of the country for generations. 
Now it appears her passing means the court and U.S. law will likely become more conservative. But as Katie Simpson shows us, replacing her is not a done deal yet. <laughs> An overwhelming sense of grief hangs over the Supreme Court. Heartache over the loss of an icon made worse for some because of the timing of Ruth Bader Ginsburg's death. Seeing such, uh, you know, division uh, and partisanship and, and, and anger and, and just so much hurt in this country. It's where we are and I'm terrified. There is a sense of dread here. Ginsburg's dying wish not to be replaced until a new president is installed will be ignored. It's a slight to her memory uh, and it's a, it's a travesty and a tragedy. Donald Trump will nominate a replacement this week. A woman, he says. Republican senators are ready to use their majority to approve a new justice before the election, despite making this argument in 2016 to reject then-President Barack Obama's Supreme Court pick. There is a long tradition that you don't do this in an election year. Senator Ted Cruz sounds very different today. So the president was elected to do this and the Senate was elected to confirm th this nomination. But two Republican senators, Alaska's Lisa Murkowski and Maine's Susan Collins, say they won't support a nominee before the election. If the Democrats are going to block Trump's pick, they need two more to break ranks. <laughs> Mourners are not very optimistic. I think it's disgustingly hypocritical on the part of the Republican Party. Across the street from the Supreme Court in the growing memorial sits Capitol Hill. Democrats here are trying to come up with stalling tactics, ways to prevent the Trump administration from appointing a replacement quickly. We have our options. We have arrows in our quiver that I'm not about to discuss right now. Democrats aren't ruling out trying to impeach the president again as a way to tie up the Senate a sign of just how bitter this fight is going to be as both sides dig in. Katie Simpson, CBC News, Washington. A large international bank with branches across Canada has once again been caught participating in money laundering. The revelations about HSBC come from U.S. Treasury Department documents leaked through the website BuzzFeed to the International Consortium of Investigative Journalists. That includes CBC and Radio Canada. Terence McKenna has the story. When Joaquin El Chapo Guzman was operating the world's largest drug cartel out of Sinaloa, Mexico, he was doing most of his banking through Europe's largest bank, HSBC. American authorities discovered that the Sinaloa cartel moved $881 million through HSBC accounts as bank officials turned a blind eye to the illegality. In 2012, the U.S. Justice Department prepared 175 charges against HSBC for money laundering, but then let the company off with a DPA deferred prosecution agreement. The bank promised to mend its ways and paid a record $1.9 billion fine. Now a 16-month investigation by the International Consortium of Investigative Journalists has found that HSBC went right back to the business of handling dirty money, at least $4.4 billion it considered suspicious. The evidence comes from a massive leak of SARS suspicious activity reports from FinCEN, the U.S. Treasury office that investigates international financial crimes. The bank reports are not necessarily evidence of criminal conduct, and banks are not required to shut down accounts involved in suspected money laundering. HSBC was not alone. The documents show that Deutsche Bank, J.P. Morgan, Bank of New York Mellon, and others conducted similar highly suspicious transactions for known criminals. The documents include over 2,400 suspicious transactions from multiple Canadian banks and corporations. In fact, Canada was in the top 10 countries with residents identified in the leaks. Canada has to do much more to crack down on money laundering, according to NDP MP Charlie Angus, the story of Toronto and Canada. who has tracked these issues for years. Uh, in fact, there's an expression that's used internationally that if you want to clean your dirty money, come to Canada and you can, it's called snow washing. So there's even a, an expression for how Canada is such an easy mark to hide dirty money. HSBC declined to answer questions about the suspicious transactions, but issued a statement claiming that the bank 
is a much safer institution than it was in 2012. Terence McKenna, CBC News, Toronto. Canada's embattled Governor General will be back in the spotlight this week. On Wednesday, Julie Payette will read the speech from the throne. That's expected to be a visual reminder of the controversy surrounding her office. Ashley Burke tells us why it's an awkward situation for both her and the Prime Minister. I am convinced that anyone can rise to any occasion. The Governor General is always at the centre of this ceremony but never will at the centre of such a controversy. One has never seen as prolonged a criticism of a vice regal person as in this particular case. On Wednesday, Julie Payette will be outlining the direction of the country, while under investigation for claims she created a toxic environment at her own office. I expect that both the Prime Minister and the Governor General are in an uncomfortable position. The Prime Minister's office writes the speech, but the Governor General can write into it. The last time Paya added 11 extra paragraphs, including this. We know that we are inextricably bound to the same space-time continuum. This time, some will be watching and weighing every syllable to see if Payette uses the speech from the throne to defend herself or her office. I think it'll be interesting to see if Her Excellency makes a point of addressing the criticisms in some direct or indirect way. Those criticisms include claims of harassment, misspending of public funds, and a disdain for RCMP increasing security costs and risks. Every Canadian has the right to a safe, secure workspace free from uh, harassment. Mr. Prime Minister, is the Prime Minister skirted the controversy at first, but later called Payette an excellent Governor General. Kind words that whistleblowers were upset about, one even calling it a kick to the stomach. Trudeau also said he has no plans to replace her right now. We have engaged a third party reviewer to uh, follow up on these serious allegations and we will uh, wait for the reviewer to uh, do their work. What I think he was trying to do was temper that statement with the fact that he had just instituted a truly historic independent third party investigation into the allegations against the Governor General. Now that has never happened before in the history of this country. A way for Trudeau to potentially diffuse some tension between himself and the Governor General before they're together again in the spotlight. Ashley Burke, CBC News, Ottawa. CBC News will have special coverage of the speech from the throne as the government lays out its plans for dealing with COVID-19 while trying to reopen the economy. TV coverage begins Wednesday at 1.30 Eastern, led by our chief political correspondent, Rosemary Barton, and featuring Vashi Capellos, host of Power and Politics. Tonight, the Emmy Awards has gone where no major award show has gone before. A live broadcast during this pandemic. It's a different kind of show, no red carpet, no audience, but there's a much bigger Emmy story tonight, all about the CBC show Schitt's Creek, dominating right from the start. Thank you, uh, members of the uh, uh, Television Academy. You see, I told you I was good. Oh my goodness, this tent's on fire. Daniel Levy, Shit's Creek. Annie Murphy, Shit's Creek. Oh my goodness. Austin Gravish gets to follow this fantastic story. And Austin, what a night for this Canadian comedy. Ian, it has been a huge night for the cast and crew of this series, which started right here on CBC. You know, Schitt's Creek was nominated for 15 Emmys going into tonight. We can tell you they've now won nine, seven of which were announced tonight. And this has been a fantastic day, not only for the crew and the actors on this show, but also fans who are eagerly watching tonight as they kind of say goodbye. This is the last series of this show. Let's take a look now at how they got here. Schitt's Creek has brought laughs, tears, and an escape. I've woken up in a Black Mirror episode. I started watching the show in March when I got sick with COVID, and it made me feel like I wasn't, or I was a little less alone, despite everything that's been going on. The CBC Commission smash comedy follows a wealthy family that suddenly finds itself broke and forced to live in Schitt's Creek, a small town the Roses once bought as a joke. The show developed a cult following. Then its popularity exploded internationally when it hit Netflix. What does Schitt's Creek mean to you? I mean, this show's changed my life. Um, I've met people 
all over the world and even flown all to the States twice because of this show. Where's David? Stop yelling. The six season series already won two awards before tonight, including outstanding casting for a comedy series and outstanding contemporary costumes for sites like this. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the marriage of Patrick Brewer and David. The show considered groundbreaking by many for its representation of queer love. I can sit down with my elderly grandma and watch it, and she's become so much more open-minded because of it. The final season is available on CBC Gem and is expected to hit Netflix in October. And this is a record-setting night for this show and the Emmys. And all of these awards uh, are, are, are fantastic news for the crew who've been eagerly watching tonight at a socially distant celebration in Toronto. I just want to go over a, a few of the awards. There's almost too many to list, but Catherine O'Hara won uh, Best Actress. Eugene Levy won Best Actor. His son, Dan Levy, won an award for directing the Best Comedy Series, along with a couple of other awards. And he actually gave an acceptance speech a little earlier on this evening in Toronto. Let's take a listen. Getting to write David Rose, getting to write this show, getting to tell the stories has been the greatest, most cathartic experience of my life. Thank you to CBC and Pop for broadcasting these stories without hesitation. And this night is a big one for the fans you saw in my story. I just got a message from one of them who's over in London, England, near London, England, in fact, tonight watching. And she tells me that she and her friends have tears uh, with tonight's news. You captured the joy of the story so nicely. Austin Gravish in Winnipeg tonight. Friends and political foes alike are fondly remembering Canada's 17th prime minister tonight. He gave me that time and that attention. John Turner was a person who could walk down the main street and meet people that he knew by name. Still ahead on The National, more on former Prime Minister John Turner's legacy, including my interview with another former Prime Minister and Turner's political rival. You had an option, sir. You could have said, I am not going to do it. Reflections on this moment and more from Brian Mulroney. And next, we know that testing is a big part of how well we cope with COVID, and you have lots of questions about it. Is it possible for schools to have on-site COVID testing? The answer to that and more from our doctors right after this. Canada has now rolled out its first saliva test, BC unveiling it this week, designed for kids, and a welcome development given scenes like this. As COVID cases continue to rise across the country, so do the lineups at many testing centres. In some places, people are waiting for hours only to be turned away. A little bit uh, anxious that I need to wait another day to get, uh, to get tested. You will get the one in two patients who might not like it, but you have most of the patient cooperating. My daughter had sniffles, so we wanted to get her tested. With the return to school, to work, and the cold and wet weather coming, both the demand and anxiety around testing is growing. This week, Ottawa announced billions in funding to cut wait times and triple the daily national testing capacity. But how will it work? And is it enough? So there are lots of questions, and for some answers, we're joined now by Dr. Srini Vasamurthy, an infectious disease specialist and investigator at BC Children's Hospital here in Vancouver, and Dr. Daniel Martin, a family doctor and chief medical executive at Women's College Hospital in Toronto. And Dr. Martin, let's start with you. It may seem obvious, but is the surge in testing matching the, the surge we're seeing in the number of cases? It's a great question, actually. So uh, although we are seeing an increase in testing, the increase in positive cases is outpacing that increase. So the rate of, of uh, positive numbers is increasing as well. So we're not just seeing artifact. The sense that people are getting out there that we may be potentially heading into a second wave and that if we don't act swiftly, especially in some parts of the country, to try to slow the transmission of the virus, um, that we could head into a, a significant second wave is real um, and, we, and we need to be concerned about it. And Dr. Murthy, given what is happening across the country, who should be getting tested? 
Like at this, at this stands now, every province has their own sort of different recommendations right now. So I can't give national or broad scope recommendations. Um, obviously, if you have symptoms, you should be tested, and every province has that in place. Um, testing before going to a party if you're asymptomatic is not recommended, um, both the test and the party, that is. Um, asymptomatic contacts have different recommendations in different places. So I'd listen to the public health folks in your region for advice there. Yeah, it is a big country, it's complicated, and the COVID picture, even though the virus is the same, the, the circumstances across the country aren't necessarily the same. Uh, Dr. Martin, on testing, how, how effective is the testing we have now? Uh, well, most parts of the country are still using the nasopharyngeal swab, uh, which is the kind of gold standard test, and it is uh, a very accurate test. Um, as we heard in BC, there's now a a sort of gargle and a spit, a swish and spit test that's being implemented for kids. And we see uh, increasing numbers of those uh, kinds of uh, new tests coming uh, into play in different places across the country. And in general, those tests are more convenient but slightly less accurate. We're going to talk more about that saliva test in just a moment. But uh, Dr. Martin, we've seen demand for the test grow since schools reopened. And, and we have this question on video. Is it possible for schools to have on-site COVID testing? The short answer is yes, it's absolutely possible, and sometimes it may be um, absolutely appropriate. We have to remember there are a lot of schools out there, and every time we pull a healthcare team out to, to go into a school, that's a team that's not available to do something else. And so in different parts of the country, it may or may not be more feasible. Um, and of course, children aren't going to be tested without the written consent of a parent or guardian. So there's lots of complexities in-school testing, but it's actu actually something that's actively being looked at in many parts of the country. And many testing centers, including the one at the hospital where I work, are, are preparing to do that where it's appropriate. All right, let's go back to, to that gargle test that uh, is rolling out here in British Columbia. Dr. Murthy, is it a game changer? Well, it's a step forward in improving the tolerability of, these, of this test for kids. Um, as many people who are watching have probably been tested, it's an uncomfortable test that's currently being used as we swab the back of your throat through your nose. Um, and so for kids, it was decided that a swish and spit might be more tolerable. Um, so that's being rolled out across British Columbia right now. It uses the same PCR-based technology. And so for, from a capacity perspective, it doesn't necessarily make things flow through faster but it improves the tolerability. So I wouldn't call it a game changer, but it's a game improver, no question. All right, back to you, Dr. Martin. Uh, asymptomatic people with COVID, we hear a lot of talk about that. Uh, and, and here's a video question. I'm just wondering if any of the tests approved in Canada can reliably detect COVID in asymptomatic and pre-symptomatic people yet. So the short answer is all tests are more accurate if the person has symptoms. And it's not because they have symptoms, it's because of how much virus you're shedding. And so um, uh, testing a person who has not yet developed symptoms, uh, but is going to develop symptoms three days from now, if they're not shedding any virus, then there's nothing for that test to pick up. Uh, therefore, all of the available tests, even the gold standard uh, test, are, are less accurate in a person who has no symptoms at all. All right. Uh, well, thanks to both of you. These uh, numbers keep going up uh, in most of the country. And of course, concern on the part of a lot of people go up too. So thank you for fielding some of those questions. Thanks, Ian. Thanks, Ian. And as we mentioned, we will continue to ask your questions about COVID-19. So you can send those to us. Message us directly on Instagram at CBC The National, or you can send us an email at covid at cbc.ca. Right after this, an intense political rivalry and a unique friendship. With one signature of a pen, you've reversed that, thrown us into the north-south influence of the United States. Former Prime Minister Brian Mulroney remembers John Turner next. But first, more memories of Canada's 17th Prime Minister. I've been interacting with Mr. Turner really throughout my political career. For me, what, what I found most precious was that every time we were in the, the same room together, he gave me that time and that attention and frankly, even that affection. And uh, to know that you're in the presence of a former prime minister and he's seeing you as a person and believes in you and what you're trying to do for political office and for service, I, that, I, I just thought that was a very special and remarkable part about him.
that I had no option. Well, Truman, your next you, question, you had an option, sir. You could have said, I am not going to do it. This remains one of the most memorable exchanges in Canadian politics. Brian Mulroney challenging John Turner over Liberal patronage appointments during the 1984 election debate. The people of Canada, from coast to coast, have spoken. Widely considered to have cost Turner the election and ending his time as Prime Minister 79 days after he replaced Pierre Trudeau. Turner went on to face Mulroney again four years later. This time, free trade with the United States dominated the election and led to yet another iconic moment between the pair. You've reversed that, thrown us into the north-south influence of the United States with a duck. and will reduce, us, will reduce us, I'm sure, to a colony of the United States. An issue the former Prime Minister held on to years later. On the uh, trade issue, I'm offered free trade. But I had the advantage over Mulroney. I read the agreement. While Turner and Mulroney were rivals on the political stage, it was a different story behind the scenes. A relationship built on mutual respect and admiration. That camaraderie with others, now part of his legacy. And we are joined now by former Prime Minister Brian Mulroney. And Mr. Mulroney, thank you so much uh, for being here. I I'd like to start by asking you how you're remembering John Turner this weekend. Well, I think he, his death is a major loss for Canada because John was a major contributor to public life in this country and made a, quite a marvelous contribution. You know, a man should be judged on his entire life and his entire career. And if you look at it that way, uh, John Turner was a spectacular success. He did many things extremely well, and he's known great success in his life. Uh, he was a great family man. He was a great parliamentarian. Uh, he had great success in uh, justice and finance. And so he was, um, he was a remarkable Canadian who deserves to be remembered with great respect. A lot of Canadians this, this weekend, particularly younger Canadians who may not remember the 84 and 88 election campaigns, have seen those sound bites of, of the two of you in the debates. We know how the elections ended up. You seem like such fierce rivals at the debating podium in the House of Commons, and yet I understand you guys were friendly away from all of that. Was politics a little different back then? It was, uh, and uh, John Turner was a, a rare person. He was a gentleman in Canadian politics. Uh, he could attack us, which he did. It was his job to attack us very vigorously, and I have all the scars to prove it. But there was no malice in, in Mr. Turner. Uh, he approached politics as a noble calling, and he conducted himself with dignity and with fairness. And so uh, people should have a strong and very good recollection of his contribution to Canada. And so let me ask you this. What do you think his legacy should be? Well, his legacy is going to be his entire career. I first met John Turner in the mid-60s in Montreal when he was a rising star in liberal politics. He was uh, chairman of the Junior Bar Association, of which I was a member. And so we knew each other quite well in those days and then better in the ensuing years. He went on, indeed, people who predicted uh, that he would one day become prime minister turned out to be absolutely right. But he went into the Pearson government and into the Trudeau government in justice and finance, did a remarkable job by any standard retired for seven years and then came back to become prime minister. Uh, so this is quite a, uh, a list of achievements. You know, there are very few prime ministers in Canadian history, and he was one of them. Uh, in, in a country of, we're, we're getting pretty close to 40 million people. Now that's pretty good going by any standard. And John was a great contributor to Canadian public life. Is there anything you can tell me about him that might surprise some of our viewers, especially those who only know him as the politician that they saw on stage or on the screen? Something behind the scenes that, uh, that you would have seen? Well, he, you know, because of the nature of the House of Commons, uh, the exchanges are oftentimes, and the attacks from the opposition on the government are oftentimes brutal or appear to be very brutal. Uh, on, on the television screen, and indeed sometimes they were. And, and John indulged in that as well. Uh, but he did not believe in the politics of personal destruction. 
John Turner was a very devout. He was a devout Catholic, and he lived his life uh, pursuant to a number of principles, including, of course, a family values, which he respected and honored. And you put it all together, and, and with a gentleman in politics, then you had quite a package of a, of a man who conducted himself with dignity and respect. And I had a lot of admiration for John. And I understood the nature of the beast. When he was attacking me, he was doing it out of duty. I think more out of duty uh, than out of pleasure, and vice versa. And so we maintained a very friendly and cordial relationship pretty well all of our lives. And that's a, that takes in a fair amount of time. Well, Mr. Mulroney, we really appreciate your time. And it's very nice to have you on the program. Thank you. Thank you, Ian. And as we go to break, one more reflection on former Prime Minister John Turner. I spent uh, many hours with him over the years, and uh, he was a person who was generous. Uh, I would say that one of the great qualities of John Turner was he had what I would term a talent for friendship. He had the famous Rolodex with hundreds of names, and he called those people on the Rolodex on their birthday every year. Uh, he is someone that John Diefenbaker, the former prime minister, once said publicly, uh, he was a person, John Turner was a person who could walk down the main street of most cities and towns in Canada and meet people that he knew by name. And that is a very rare quality in today's world. Tomorrow, the UN General Assembly celebrates its 75th anniversary, but COVID-19 has made it a virtual affair. Stephen D'Souza explains there are fears that doing diplomacy over Zoom means a lot will get lost in translation. It's often called diplomatic speed dating. The UN General Assembly is a showy affair with lofty speeches and power lunches. But this year, leaders are staying home their speeches pre-recorded, the global pandemic and onerous travel restrictions making gatherings like this unrealistic. The stakes could not be higher. Despite that, United Nations Secretary General Antonio Guterres has set lofty goals. I will make a strong appeal to the international community to mobilize all efforts for the global ceasefire to become a reality by the end of the year. Guterres admits rallying the world to tackle COVID-19 in this format won't be easy. I still believe that uh, uh, personal contact is an essential tool in diplomatic efforts. Analysts say while the overall impact of the General Assembly is debatable, those face-to-face -face meetings are vital. That being gone, I think, reduces the value of the General Assembly. Normally, this street in front of the United Nations would be blocked off crawling with security, media and delegates looking for access to power. But this year, as you can see, the situation is quite different. U.S. President Donald Trump teased appearing in person, but that's not happening, sapping even more drama from the event. The idea that prime ministers and presidents are going to be sitting at home with a bucket of popcorn, watching each other's um, televised speeches is, uh, is a bit silly. Humanitarian groups say elevating their issues at the General Assembly is always a challenge. That challenge doubles with a virtual meeting focused largely on the pandemic. In a place like South Sudan, we had maybe 35 or 40 COVID cases. We had 300 people killed by arms and maybe two or 3,000 people by malaria and tuberculosis. A reality he worries may be lost if leaders choose to tune out. Stephen D'Souza, CBC News, New York. Next on The National, finding new ways to celebrate. I can tell you one thing. They never taught us in seminary how to do services in a drive-in. The drive-in Rosh Hashanah, next. <laughs> it sure sounds like a celebration, and it is. Not even the pandemic could stop Rosh Hashanah. This year, the Jewish New Year was rung in in a creative and a safe way at a drive-in. It's our moment. Well, it certainly is not the traditional way to celebrate Rosh Hashanah.
We are trying to have a very serious and beautiful and joyful service in a drive-in. How can we bring people together in a safe way to feel the joy of the holiday? We are a downtown synagogue. This is a downtown location. This is the weirdest place I have ever done a service, but this is an extraordinary year. We have to do extraordinary things. Well, I can tell you one thing. They never taught us in seminary how to do services in a drive-in. When it was made uh, clear to us that you can have cars in a drive-in, as long as people stay in their cars, we immediately jumped on the idea. We can bring the community together. They can at least see each other through the windows of their cars. And the feeling of being a community together, the excitement is possible to build here. Easy to feel her excitement, and Rabbi Goldstein said that what she was hoping to do, the message she was trying to send, I think is a, is a good message for a wider audience as well. She says we should be as creative as possible and that we can be both productive and positive. So think about that as you begin your new week. That is The National for Sunday, September the 20th. Good night.